Standardising routine neonatal checks, their documentation and adherence to NICE guidelines. A completed audit cycle by Dr Abigail G, core medical trainee at BRI in Bristol. And Gemma Goff, ST1 in paediatrics at the RUH in Bath. So the background to this audit, all babies require a newborn check within 72 hours of delivery. And there are a high turnover of SHOs completing these checks, with rotations changing every four months. Other health professionals now undertake these checks, such as midwives, and the current performer that was in use in Swindon when we did the audit was ambiguous and did not cover all aspects of the baby check. So the aims of the audit then were to standardise neonatal examinations in Swindon in line with current guidelines and to improve the documentation of the neonatal examinations. So we researched to try and find the standards that we should be using for this audit and we had a look at the NICE guidelines and they reference the National Screening Committee guidelines and we use those as our standards for the audit. So to summarise the guidelines then, the components of the new newborn check should include number one, developmental dysplasia of the hip. So you needed to assess if there was any family history to make a baby at risk and this was done by asking the following question. Is there a first degree relative in the family who has had a hip problem that started when they were a baby or a young child? And then the other risk factor was breech presentation after 32 weeks gestation. The second part of the newborn check was examination of the eyes. And here you had to assess the risk factors and then examine the eyes looking for the red reflex. The third part of a newborn check was to do with congenital heart defects. And again, you had to assess the risk factors and then perform a full cardiovascular examination. The fourth part was looking at undescended testes and this involved examining the testes and if only one was undescended nothing needed to be done but could be followed up by the GP but if both testes were undescended the baby needed to be re uh, reviewed by a senior paediatrician within 24 hours uh, looking for ambiguous genitalia. And then the final part of the newborn check was the general examination and this was split into two parts. The first part was general information gathering, looking at relevant antenatal, perinatal and postnatal history, whether the parents had any concerns, how the baby was feeding, whether they were breastfeeding or bottle feeding, and whether the baby had passed meconium and urine. And then the second part was a full examination covering all the systems that hadn't already been examined and the weight and head circumference of the baby, which in Swindon was done at delivery by the midwife. And then all the findings need to be recorded both on the performer and in the baby's red books. And then the findings need to be confirmed with the parents. So the methods we used to carry out our audit. All baby checks that had been completed on the Mondays in October 2010 were collected for analysis. The reason we did it on consecutive weeks was so that different members of staff would be analysed as we did baby checks for a whole week and then rotated round. The baby check forms were kindly photocopied by one of the nursery nurses who collected them for us before we analysed the data. This table shows the standards that we were using in the audit and we wanted 100% in all of the criterion. 34 forms were analysed and these had been completed by 32, 32 had been completed by SHOs encompassing four different doctors and two had been completed by midwives. This, this chart shows the results and you can see um, some are already achieving 100% whereas others were right down at 0% compliance. In a bit more detail, we showed a good documentation of if the baby had been feeding and whether meconium and urine had been passed and also good documentation of if there was a first degree relative with hip dysplasia. But there was poor documentation of if the baby had been breached after 32 weeks gestation, poor documentation of risk factors for heart disease and parental concerns had only been documented in just over half of the forms. And this was disappointed. We knew the doctors were talking to the families about this, it's just that it wasn't being documented. There was a lot of non-standardised free handwriting on the bottom of the forms. SHOs had been creating their own abbreviations because they were tired of writing out long sentences. For example, BF was often on the form. Did this mean breastfed or did it mean bottle fed? NVD, normal vaginal delivery, was commonly written. And did this mean that it wasn't breach or it wasn't a C-section? No concerns was commonly written as well. And again, it was unclear whether that meant of the parents, of the midwives, of the doctor. No risk factors. Again, it wasn't identified whether this meant no risk factors for sepsis or heart or hip problems. So there was a wide variety um, 
and different standards in the documentation that we saw. These are two examples of the old form. And you can see one of them is a lot of freehand writing, which is very time consuming when you've got lots of baby checks to perform. And this is why the sloppy abbreviations came into play, really. So on to the audit cycle. We collated the forms already and compared them against the guidelines that we'd found. It was time to create a new baby check form. We did this and gained feedback from our team and from the midwives and made a few tweaks. And here is the new pro forma. You can see there's a lot of tick boxes and yes, no boxes. Implementing change took a long time. It actually took five months and three committees to get the form passed into use. It had to go in front of the patient records committee, the perinatal action group who only met twice a year and then had to be okayed by the midwives as well. But once the form was finally implemented, we went ahead and completed our audit cycle. So the re-audit was done in May 2011. Again, we collect forms on four consecutive Mondays to encompass forms that have been completed by different individuals. This table shows the results. And in more detail, we showed improved documentation of whether the baby had been breached after 32 weeks gestation and risk factors for heart disease. We also showed improved documentation in um, risk of hip dysplasia and whether the baby had passed meconium and urine. Parental concerns were still only being documented in three quarters of checks. And we knew that everyone was asking this, but still not everyone was writing it down. And we feel one reason for this was because we left a white space rather than a yes-no box for this option. Disappointingly, documentation of feeding had actually decreased from 94 to 83%. On further investigation, we found this came down to one SHO who had just omitted this question throughout one of his Mondays. There was no real reason for this. So to conclude, neonatal examination is a vital screening tool for identifying anomalies of the newborn. The examinations at Swindon are now standardised in line with the national guidelines and documentation has been improved. This will have a positive effect on patient safety and avoid problems in the future. So an update on where we are now. The paediatric department in Swindon now includes teaching on the NSC guidelines as part of their departmental induction. And currently I'm now working at the IUH in Bath, which is under the same trust as Swindon for their obstetric department. And we're looking at the possibility of introducing the performer to Bath and possibly in an electronic format to form the basis of a baby's electronic notes. Thank you very much.